Hey all and welcome to this long awaited tutorial. One of the most popular scenes you can build that draws attention and interest is a waterfall. And what better way to take things to the next level by adding in some whitewater rapids and a mysterious system of caves behind it. I've dreamed of places like this. Building a diorama helps bring my dream a little closer to reality. So if this is something that interests you, just sit back and enjoy watching as I bring this model to life. The inspiration for this model comes from a digital image I found online. And it will be designed to fit nicely on the shelves behind my workbench. In HO scale of course. The frame of the diorama is built using 7mm plywood. The plywood will give the diorama some rigidity, given that it will be mostly a foam core. It's assembled, glued and nailed together. Simply gluing and clamping will be enough, however I also nailed the frame together so I could continue building without having to wait for the glue to dry. Expanded polystyrene is used to fill out the interior of the model. I'll be using some hot wire foam cutters to create the caves later and expanded polystyrene cuts really well with the hot wire tools. To speed up the gluing process I use polyurethane glue. Once the foam is glued, clamped or weighed down, it takes around 3 hours for the glue to set and we can move ahead. To neaten up the edges I use my DIY foam cutter. I have a separate tutorial if you're interested in building one for yourself. Once the cave system has been drawn onto the foam, using a small HO scale figure as a size guide, I use one of my favourite foam cutting tools. This is the freehand router from the Hotwire Foam Factory. You can shape it to basically any shape and cut away. Just make sure to use it in a well ventilated area because you'll create fumes and you definitely don't want to be breathing these into your lungs. Next it's simply a matter of cutting out sections of foam. You can see how easy the hot wire slices through the expanded polystyrene. I gradually cut away forming the caves until the main formation of the cave system has been created. Don't worry if you don't have hot wire foam cutters because you can always cut and scrape away the foam using a knife like I'm doing here for the riverbed. To help soften all the cut marks and to also widen the caves a little, I use a soldering heat torch. This one works really well because there's no flame. It's basically a tiny heat gun, perfect for getting into the tight spots. To form the interior walls of the caves and the rest of the landform, I'm using Sculptit Modeling Mix from Officeworks. This stuff is perfect because it is a plaster infused with paper fibers and it can be formed as desired and will hold its shape. A small amount of water is added to create a thick paste. I also added some burnt umber pigment and some brown paint to get rid of the stark white once it dries. Once it's all mixed the plaster is slapped onto the model and pushed around until it fills out the caves. I continue to push it around and manipulate it so I get complete coverage and I also create undulations and the beginning of stalactites and stalagmites. Basically creating a bit of interest throughout the caves. As you work the plaster you have about 10 to 15 minutes of working time. Once it starts to set I continue to smoothen it out giving me the final wall texture of the caves. I also use some sculpting tools and wet paintbrush to help create and add detail to the walls as I go. The process is continued along each section of the cave until the entire scene is covered. You can always go back in and add more detail later, which is what I do when adding the stalactites and stalagmites. While that's drying I'll make the stalactites. To make these I use air drying clay. A tiny dab is rolled into a cylinder and set aside to dry. The more the better and I try to create a wide variety of sizes. I probably made close to 100 of these and could have used even more. Once there are more than enough I add a bit of colour. It's not the final colour, just a wash to get rid of the stark white. Any light brown will work, just be aware that the clay will soften when soaked in the wash so I try to colour them without letting them soak for too long. Once they have had time to dry, they can be fixed into the cave. For this I find superglue gel works quite well. A small drop on the end of the stalactite is more than enough. 
it's then pressed into the desired location. The dry plaster sucks up any moisture in the glue pretty fast and after about a second or two the stalactite is fixed into position. This process is repeated over and over until you achieve the look you want. It's a time consuming process but the cave system really starts to take shape when the roof is covered in stalactites. To further blend them in with the cave roof, I make a very soupy mix of plaster using Woodland Scenics Smoother. Again adding some pigment to match the colour of the cave. The runny plaster mix is applied to the base of each stalactite, however to make it a bit easier I turn the entire diorama upside down. This makes it much easier to brush on the plaster mixture, getting a more natural look. You may also want to pre-wet the area in order to get the plaster to stick a little better. Again, make sure to be careful during this step as the clay will soften, making it easy to accidentally break the stalactites. To make the stalagmites, the same plaster is used. However, it's mixed to a thicker consistency so that it can be built up underneath the stalactites. That completes the main cave construction. Now we can move on to building up the rest of the scenery. The train will be quite rocky, so a bunch of rock molds are cast with plaster of Paris. You'll want a nice thin consistency so the plaster reaches all the tiny nooks in the mold. Pre-wetting the mold will also help the plaster flow into the small gaps. When it comes to filling the molds, you don't have to always completely fill up the entire mold. A lot of the time I'll only fill the mold about a quarter of the way. Doing this will give you even more variety in the rocks you have available to fill a specific space. After a couple of hours, I'll remove them from the molds and they are ready to use. The excess plywood from the edge is removed and then more sculpted modelling mix is used to form up the terrain. This stuff sticks really well and will hold its shape. I move it around and build it up so that it's ready for the rock castings. Before sticking the castings into the plaster, be sure to thoroughly soak them in water. This will help the wet plaster layer stick to the rock casting. Don't be afraid to break the rocks as desired so they fit around any contouring that you have. This will give it a much more realistic and more unique look, especially if you're using multiples of the same mold. Castings are added and blended right across the cliff face and also along the riverbed. Once the sculpted modelling mix has started to set, I'll mix up some more plaster of Paris. The same type of plaster used to make the rock castings. I'll apply this mixture in between all the castings we just added so that none of the dark grey modelling mix is visible. You don't have to be too precise, just make sure it fills the gaps. With that layer applied, I'll wait about an hour or so and chip away at some of the white plaster. I try to create grooves, chips and cracks so that it looks like two separate castings were applied to look like one complete rock on the side of the cliff. For the rest of the landform, I carve out some more expanded polystyrene and hot glue it on top. Now basically the same process is repeated right across the surface, adding plaster, forming the basic shape of the terrain. For the fascia I'm going to use some PVC foam board, but first I need a template. To make the template I'm using a semi-rigid piece of plastic used for folder covers. It's lightly see-through which enables me to trace out the cave contour. Once that's done it's cut out and then the shape is traced onto the PVC foam board. The PVC board is quite rigid but soft enough to cut with a knife. However if you have something like the Wonder Cutter which is an ultrasonic knife, it will make the process of cutting out these shapes quite a lot easier. I actually found by planting the knife down into the cutting board and then pushing the foam through the knife, it made for much faster and neater cuts. To fix the fascia in position, I used a combination of polyurethane glue and hot glue. The hot glue helps with the initial hold and then over the next two hours, the polyurethane glue will set and hold everything in permanently. One by one each piece is glued on. The fascia on its own doesn't really blend well with the caves, so some more sculpted modelling mix is used to fill any gaps and give a smoother transition from the front of the fascia and the caves. 
And while I'm at it, I decided to add more rock work along the riverbed. I'm adding in some steps so that as the river flows, it would step down from the back as it approaches the waterfall. To add colour to the cave, I use a variety of beige colours. From what I could find online, a lot of mineral caves tended to have a very light beige colour. I used the spray quite heavy handed so that the colour would reach into all the corners and right up to the back of the cave. To protect the cave while I continue to work on the scenery, I mask it off with some painter's tape. There's hundreds of ways to paint rocks, some easier than others and the colour is really up to the person painting. For me I mixed a medium grey with a light brown to give me a nice warm grey. Whenever painting directly onto plaster, I find diluting it with water helps the paint stick, especially to the rock castings. The warm grey is liberally painted over all the rock features. To bring out the fine detail in the rocks, a black wash is applied over the top. It's a very thin wash and is applied through a spray bottle. A small amount is sprayed onto the rock surface and then excess is dabbed away. Each time the rock is sprayed and then dabbed it will gradually get darker and darker and the detail will start to show. I continue to do this across all the rocks, even the rocks along the cliff face until I get the desired look. I want the rocks to be quite dark because they would naturally be damp from the nearby river and waterfall. To help speed up the drying time, a hairdryer can be used. Next highlights are added using the original grey. I used a dry brushing technique to apply the colour over the surface, bringing out the sharp edge detail in the rocks. The remaining plaster is painted an earth brown. I quite liked the speed of using the spray bottle, so I used it again to apply the next layer of paint. Just being careful not to accidentally cover the rocks, we just painted with the brown. Now for dirt. The dirt texturing I used is actual backyard dirt that is dried and sifted into a medium and fine grade. To adjust the colour of the dirt, a light beige tile grout is added. As for the glue, I like to use Mod Podge Matte lightly diluted with water as the base layer of glue. Once the initial layer of glue is down, I start with the medium dirt mixture. That way the large rocks will have a chance to stick into the glue without rolling down the bank. After that first layer of dirt is down, I come back in with the fine dirt mixture and apply it over everything else, including over the medium dirt we've already applied. This helps blend the larger dirt in with the rest of the terrain. Any excess dirt is dusted away from the surface of the rocks with a soft brush. To permanently fix everything down, my trusty scenic glue mixture is applied. The bottle of isopropyl alcohol helps break down the surface tension so that the next layer of glue will be able to easily penetrate into the dirt ensuring it's glued down well. After the area has been thoroughly covered, any excess glue is gently removed from the surface of the rocks with a paper towel. Static grass using the Woodland Scenic Static King along with a variety of static grass from World World Scenics and Woodland Scenics is added. I start with an initial layer of 2mm fibres. This is a general covering and additional layers will be built up on top of this layer. The Static King is battery powered, however it can also be powered from a wall plug. The grass is glued using a very lightly diluted Mod Podge mat. The glue is painted over all the areas you want grass. Next the applicator is turned on, the grounding wire is touched to the surface and the applicator is shaken over the top. Like magic you'll have a nice grassy field before you know it. I continue to add grass right along the riverbank. A lot of the grass fibres won't get glued down. Using a vacuum and some tights, we can collect those loose fibres and use them again on other areas of the diorama. A second layer of longer 6mm grass is added right over the top of the initial layer. Simply applying the glue in all the areas you want the longer grass fibres and then again using the applicator, shake the next layer over the top. Don't forget to remove the excess grass with the vacuum. You can also tease some of the fibres while the glue is still wet 
to give a rough, unkept appearance. More textures are added with a variety of foams from Woodland Scenics. There's no one technique for adding these foams. I tend to add them randomly across the diorama, building up layers and mixing the colours together until I've got something that looks good. I do find sprinkling a top layer of burnt grass over the top helps ties the various foams together, but it's really up to you and the look you want to achieve. As a final texture, I add some dead leaves and bark that have been put through a blender and sifted. This layer simulates, you guessed it, dead leaves and bark. A product I've never actually used before is some Woodland Scenics foliage. This stuff is perfect for adding in creepers and vines along the cliff face. Just tear a bit off and tease it out and press it into the rocks. I ended up sprinkling some knock leaves over the vines as well for a bit more texture. All of those ground foams and leaves we applied are fixed in with some scenic glue mixture. The same stuff we use to glue down the dirt. To help add some moss to the rocks I used a little bit of fine turf. By placing it on some paper and gently blowing it you can apply the moss directly onto face in the spots you need. Nearly all of the trees except for one are Woodland Scenics fine leaf foliage. This stuff is great for easy fast shrubs on a hillside and if you take your time you can use this to construct some amazing realistic trees. Once I've got a small tree I punch a hole into the terrain Add some glue to the base of the trunk and then place the tree into the scene. The one tree that is not fine leaf foliage is this 15 cm tall knock acacia tree. It's pretty amazing what a box of fine leaf foliage can do. Now for my favourite part, adding water. Some areas of the river are quite deep, so I'm using a deep cast epoxy from AA Composites. This stuff is great for larger, deeper water features. To colour the epoxy, I used a bit of blue and brown pigment. Before adding the resin, the river needs to be dammed. It's a little tricky creating the dam for the front of the waterfall, but with some 1mm acrylic and some patience I was able to create a piece that closely followed the contouring of the rocks. The side pieces were a little easier to make, and to hold them to the sides of the diorama and to create a watertight seal, I used hot glue. You want to make sure it has a very good seal because leaks can be quite difficult to plug without getting sticky resin everywhere. The glue along the front might end up causing some damage to the scenery, however we'll be able to fix that later and it will get covered with white water anyway. The resin gets mixed two parts part A and one part of part B, the larger tub being part A and the smaller one being part B. To start with, when you mix it, it may look cloudy, however after a few minutes of mixing, it will start to become clear. When adding pigment, start with very small amounts. A little pigment goes a very long way, and once the pigment has been added, it can't be removed. I start off pouring a small amount just to test if the dam will hold. Once I'm happy, I continue to flood the area and watch as the water brings the scene to life. The resin will find its own level, so before pouring you'll also want to make sure the diorama is on a level surface. Bubbles are inevitable. Most of them will rise to the surface and pop on their own, however some will be a little bit more stubborn. Once they reach the surface we can pop them with a butane torch. A soldering torch like this is perfect because there's no flame and you're less likely to set any trees on fire. Once that's done, it's left overnight to cure. After the tape gets removed, I did a little more blending between the rocky exterior of the cave and the mineral deposits on the interior, making the transition between the two a little softer. Once the acrylic dam has been removed, you can see a little bit of the damage along the waterfront. But before I patch it up, I'm going to shave down the front edge. I'll be using the Dremel for this and it's going to get messy so I mask and cover what I can to make the cleanup a little easier. Using a sculpting tool I can shave away the corner making it look much more natural as the water cascades over the edge of the cliff. It looks a bit rough now but once we add resin back over the top it will become crystal clear again. Now is a good time to touch up the damaged spots. 
Before pouring the resin for the lower section, I added some divers. These were downloaded and printed using the Bene 4 Mono 3D printer that I'll be showing in an upcoming video. Once they are painted, they get glued strategically into the cave so it looks like they are floating and swimming under the water. Just like the top section of river, the lower section is sealed off and ready for resin. The resin is mixed up just the same and poured. It was really interesting to watch the resin flow through the cave, slowly filling up the small lagoon. There was actually a small leak, but luckily I was able to stop it by putting a small amount of pressure on the side to stop the leak. With some of the leftover resin, I was able to wipe it over the areas we carved with the Dremel. As you can see, once the resin has been applied, it becomes crystal clear again. Once it's had about 24 hours to cure, the acrylic sides can be removed. Any leftover glue can be removed by remelting it with the soldering torch and then simply wipe away any excess. The sharp edge is cut away with a sharp hobby knife. To help create the waterfall, I traced the cross section onto some scrap acrylic and then using a DIY light box on my phone, I draw out the shape I want for the waterfall. Some 1mm acrylic is stuck to the paper with the drawing on it and it's then placed into the laser cutter. Next the laser cutter program is used to take a photo of the cutting surface and now I'm able to trace out the shape I want. Once the power and speed settings are adjusted to suit the material, it can be cut out. Of course you don't need a laser cutter to do this. However, having access to a tool like this will make the process happen much faster. The alternative will be to use some 0.5mm clear styrene and cut out the shape using a hobby knife. The same process is used to cut out the front sections of the waterfall as well. To shape the acrylic and give it a nice curved look, as if it's carrying some momentum as it flows over the edge of the cliff, I heat it up using the soldering torch and gently bend it into shape. As the acrylic cools down, it will hold its shape. For the edge piece, after it's test fitted and trimmed to fit just right, I glue the acrylic together with some Weld On 3. Remember to use this stuff in a well ventilated area, as it can be quite potent. This is the best stuff for acrylic, and it only takes a few seconds to get a good permanent hold. The acrylic on its own is much too plain, so to add detail and ripples I paint them using water ripples from Woodland Scenics. I simply dribble a liberal amount over the surface of each waterfall section. I let it dry for about 20 minutes, and then I use the brush to stipple each piece creating an uneven rippled surface. With that done and dry, I attach each section onto the cliff face using some hot glue. You'll only need a tiny drop of glue, just enough to hold it in place. To fill in that big gap up top, I'll be using some more of the water ripples. This time I leave it out in the open until it turns into more of a gel-like consistency. Now it's ready to apply, and it won't just run down the front of the waterfall. It gets built up quite thick and blended in with the cascading sections of water. Some of the ripples were still a little runny, so I angled the entire diorama to help keep it just where I wanted it. As it continued to dry, I kept teasing it so that it would look like rough, fast moving water. Because it's such a thick layer, it will turn white as it dries. However, the surface is dry to the touch, so we can continue building. Now for the white water. Initially, white water effects are done by painting and dry brushing the waterfall with some white paint. Using a reference image will certainly help. I start light and gradually build up the colour until it starts to resemble fast moving water. Next I use a combination of 1mm white static grass and more water ripples product. By mixing the two together, you'll end up with a white paste that will maintain its shape as it dries. You can make it quite runny by adding less grass fibres or thicker by adding more. 
It's perfect for the effect we want, and it's really easy to push around and build up just how we want. It also maintains its colour as it dries, and there's no need to do any painting or dry brushing over the top. I work it all the way along the river, and over the edge of the waterfall as well, blending it in with the areas we just painted. I also make sure to add ripples and white water to the lower sections. General water ripples are added on top using some Mod Podge gloss. I've used this technique quite a lot in previous tutorials. After applying a small amount of gloss to the surface, I use the airbrush to push the gloss over the surface and create some fine ripples. This will all dry completely clear, leaving behind the rippling effect and the white water underneath. Now here's where I thought I was almost done. I painted the fascia black and was finished, or so I thought. In the end, I wasn't happy with the look, so I decided to make the fascia look like dirt instead. So to fix it, I painted the black areas with a brown paint and glue mixture. While the paint was still wet, I sprinkled over a layer of medium dirt texture. To permanently fix that down, I used a syringe to apply the scenic glue. After a few hours and once the glue was dry, I sanded back the dirt to knock down some of the larger granules of dirt. It gets quite dusty so you'll need to do a bit of dusting before painting. The edges of the dirt fascia get blended in with the cave interior sections. It creates a bit of a vignette effect, making it look a little more artistic and pleasing to the eye. Using some greys and dark browns, I create strata lines, giving the front of the model a more unique and interesting look. Don't forget to remove any overspray from the water. A paper towel soaked in alcohol should make light work in removing the acrylic paint. I also peeled back the ripples in the lagoon so I could redo them. Dust and Mod Podge gloss really like each other, and once the Mod Podge gets dusty, it's almost impossible to clean off. Luckily it's very easy to peel off and reapply the Mod Podge ripples. The last little effect involves removing some pillow stuffing and using it for the waterfall mist. It's surprisingly effective. And that completes this awesome model. It's heaps of fun to build interesting scenes like this and really draws the attention from the viewers. I can stare at this all day long and my imagination runs wild thinking of what it would be like to see this place in real life. If you're interested in seeing more videos like this, be sure to also check out Kathy Millett. She is a good friend and her videos are fantastic, well worth checking out. Even I learn heaps of new tips and tricks from watching her videos. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. Until the next video, cheers and thanks for watching.